Thank you very much for joining this uh, Digital Compliance Hub uh, GDPR carrying out a data protection impact assessment um, webinar. Hopefully you can see um, the slides on, on your screens. Um, if you want to ask questions, um, there's a question panel in the GoToWebinar control panel which you can use to ask questions and we'll pick that up um, towards the end. Um, I'm expecting to uh, probably uh, talk for about 40, 45 minutes and then pick up um, any questions um, at the end. Um, so, um, my name is Mark Gracie. Um, I'm the founder of the Digital Compliance Hub, which is an, an online um, digital compliance, mainly data protection, privacy, marketing compliance um, service. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that towards the end. Um, my my background is is very much in data protection. I became a data protection um, manager back in 1998 when the UK's Data Protection Act came into force and have been involved in, in uh, regulatory compliance, uh, mainly in the internet and telecoms industry uh, most of the time since, since then. So um, certainly in terms of uh, applying uh, data protection within businesses, that's very much uh, part of my, my background and, and career over quite some, some time. Um, and right now I offer uh, consultancy services and, as I say, run, run the Digital Compliance Hub as well. But this session's um, all about uh, data protection impact assessment, something new that was introduced with the uh, GDPR uh, back in May. Um, and I'm going to run through just a, a bit of a, um, a recap of where things are with GDPR in terms of DPIA and where it sort of fits into um, accountability. Talk about um, what it actually means. Uh, in terms of what the law says, look at what that means in practice and also what kind of things you should be thinking about when you uh, carry out a, a data protection impact assessment. And we'll touch on the differences between what the GDPR says and also what, from a UK perspective, um, the Information Commissioner says. And obviously, from an international perspective, uh, different regulators across Europe might have different uh, approaches to uh, their expectations uh, with regards to um, using uh, impact assessments, be, be them privacy impact assessments or data protection impact assessments, whatever you want to call them. So let's just go back to, to some of the basics. Um, hopefully you will realise uh, GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, a new European regulation came into force uh, across the whole of Europe and, and in fact applies um, extraterritorially um, outside of Europe as well if you're doing business with European citizens um, back in May uh, this, this year. Um, and not the 25th of May, as it says there, but the 28th, but uh, um, that's a, a, an aside. Um, and the two things, uh, this, this fan diagram is something I used um, when I uh, was talking about GDPR when it was, uh, well, it was uh, sort of in the two-year interim period of being um, published as a new law and, and coming into force um, and sort of represents uh, the key things that GDPR has changed or, or, or implemented. And I've highlighted in blue there the two key things that's worth bearing in mind when we talk about data protection impact assessments. Obviously, there's the uh, thing over on the right, data protection by design default, um, but also data protection impact assessments. Um, and then there's the principi princi sorry, the principle of um, accountability, which is a new general data protection regulation um, principle of, of data protection. So it sits along the other principles around lawfulness, um, uh, retention, uh, original purpose, and so on. Um, so I just want to touch very briefly on these three um, key areas and, and what they mean and how they interact with uh, data protection impact assessments. So the accountability principle, as I say, is a new principle introduced with GDPR. Um, it, in essence, it basically means it's not good enough that you are compliant. You need to be able to demonstrate that compliance and you need to be able to demonstrate you've put in place appropriate measures. So when it comes to demonstrating your accountability and demonstrating your compliance, there's various ways in which you do that. Certain organisations are required to document their processing activities, for example. Um, other organisations would be probably well placed to document as much as possible because should you ever be challenged by a, a regulator, and obviously in the UK that's the Information Commissioner's Office, um, then you've got some documentary evidence to be able to say actually this is how we do things, this is what we're doing, um, in the hope that that might fend off any investigation or further, further action. Um, but in terms of um, what we're going to be talking about today, the key areas are data protection by design and default, which we'll talk about in a second, 
um, and data protection impact assessments as well as um, um, those as tools that fit in within this accountability principle model essentially. And the data protection by design and default um, approach is, is basically a, a methodology that says whenever you do something new um, or involving personal data perhaps in a new way or in a way that you've not done before um, you're setting up a new service or, or whatever you must take data protection seriously at the um, outset of the project and as part of uh, an integral part of that project to determine um, all the data protection rights and freedoms and privacy rights and freedoms are, are, are applied uh, in the project from the outset so um, there's no excuses to uh, basically um, leave it to the last minute and think of it as an afterthought and and, and the approach um, from a data protection by design and prints uh, the default um, uh, position is very much again demonstrating that you've taken appropriate technical um, organizational measures uh, in uh, and uh, in consideration for the project um, and as I say, the data protection has been considered from the outset and, and throughout the, the design and build of the, the service, the project, the system or, or whatever it is that you're working on. And one of the key tools that's useful for helping you um, deliver on that uh, data protection by design and default is the concept of data protection impact assessments. For all intents and purposes, they're a, a risk management exercise. Um, what risks do we have from the processing of the data? And how do we mitigate those risks um, to prevent any data protection issues? Um, and if you if you carry these out, then the idea is that you will have a document documented um, approach to uh, those considerations and that risk um, assessment, um, which you can then use as part of um, any documentary evidence that you need as part of the project, as part of a wider compliance program. Um, but again, um, to help meet the accountability principle. So let's look at what the law says about data protection impact assessments, um, which, um, and this is very much from a, a UK perspective, but um, also, as I said, uh, other regulators across Europe um, and, and, and potentially across the world might look at this in slightly different ways. Um, so I will touch on what the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK, um, says with regards to data protection impact assessments, because it's slightly different than what the law says. Um, the law is there, GDPR, what the GDPR says um, goes, but the uh, ICO adds some extra stuff on in addition to that. So from a GDPR perspective, it's all about high risk. If there is high risk to a data subject, then you must carry out a data protection impact assessment. Um, and we'll talk about what high risk might mean in a, in a second. Um, but the Information Commissioner essentially says, if you look at their website and, and look at what they say about data protection impact assessments, they talk about the fact that GDPR says it's all about the high risk. If there's a high risk to the data subjects and the processing, then you must carry out a data protection impact assessment. But then they add, it's also good practice to do a data protection impact assessment for any other major project which requires the processing of personal data, which given that um, from a, a regulatory point of view, um, in the UK, we've had the concept of privacy impact assessments and, and indeed privacy by design for, for quite some time as best practice. And whilst the GDPR enforces that in, in law, it only enforces it in a very specific set of circumstances, which is this high risk um, profile. But the ICO is saying, actually, we expect you to carry out one um, regardless of whether it's high risk or not, because we think that if there are circumstances where you're doing something different with data, maybe introducing a new way of processing data uh, or using data in a completely different way, you really ought to assess whether there's any risks uh, in, involved in that. And, and, and it kind of makes sense, um, but if you're relying on the, what the GDPR says, then uh, it might be a bit disappointing to find if you're in the UK that you've got to do, do it a bit much, uh, much more wider uh, um, application than uh, you might have first thought. Now there are some exemptions, um, for example if the ICO tell you you don't need to carry out a data protection impact assessment in any particular scenario then you don't need to carry one out um, and, um, and also if you are required by law or regulation or some other circumstance that you have no choice but you have to process the data in, in a specific way then there's a good chance you might not need to um, carry out a data protection impact assessment um, and also if you've uh, done something very similar <coughs> excuse me, assessment wise, then um, there's a possibility that you might not in all scenarios need to carry out a data protection impact assessment um, every time. So if we look at this from the, the wider ICO approach, 
Um, yes, GDPR sets out very specific terms, and we'll, we'll touch about on that in a second. Um, from an ICO perspective, it's much wider than that. Um, and it does mean that you need to consider scenarios where you may be moving from one type of system to another system, be it manual to automatic or um, an, an old system to a new system and how you transfer the data between the systems and all the things that are involved in that project. A, data protection by design and default dictates that you've got to consider data protection ramifications as part of that. And the wider context of data protection impact assessments means you also need to consider whether you need to carry out a DPIA. And we'll talk about what that might look like in practice um, a bit later on. So when it comes to what do we call, refer to as high risk, um, the, there is some European guidance from the um, what used to be called the Article 29 Working Party, so the group of European regulators that sets out um, some very specific details. When it comes to the GDPR, it actually talks about really the kind of processing that's going to be considered high risk is likely to be, but not, not um, uh, limited to, um, profiling. So using data to, to profile um, data subjects. Um, if you're processing large quantities of sensitive data, and by that I mean what's defined as special categories of data, so special categories being defined as data relating to health, uh, religion, uh, political um, beliefs, sexual orientation, uh, biometric uh, data used for identification purposes and, and so on, or even criminal records um, as well. If you're processing large amounts of that data, um, where large may not be um, clearly defined, but um, would be relevant to um, the, the population and um, the data set and, and various things like that. If you're processing large amounts of sensitive or special category of data, then you need to carry out a data protection impact assessment. Um, and also if you're doing um, large scale public monitoring, so you're using say CCTV to uh, carry out um, various activities to look at um, what people's behaviors are in, in a crowd or in, in, at an event or, or something like that. But, if we look much more wider than that, and the GDPR allows the regulators to consider other scenarios that um, high risk is referred to, or indeed, as I said, because the ICO has this approach that actually you should carry out data protection impact assessments regardless of whether it's high risk or not. Um, the, the framework for what you need to consider is actually much wider than this. And uh, yes, yeah, sorry, apologies that the text is so little, but there's quite a lot to fit in. Um, so you do need to think about profiling and large amounts of um, special categories of data and public monitoring, but you might want to consider new technologies that you're you're using, carrying out data protection impact assessment if you're using new technology. Um, if your processing could lead to the prevention of access to a service, for example, so you're doing some kind of vetting or, or um, some other kind of activity, whether um, biometric or genetic data is involved in the processing, whether you're combining or matching data sets, whether the processing isn't transparent and, the, and you're not able to meet that right to be informed, so the data subjects would be un, unaware that you're doing some kind of processing. That if there's a circumstance that that applies, then you definitely would have to carry out the data protection impact assessment, um, which is what non-transparent processing refers to. If you're carrying out tracking or behaviours of, of data subjects, profiling um, of children and, and vulnerable adults, risk to physical harm, so the processing could uh, um, have actual uh, physical consequences, um, or if your um, whatever your processing is involves could lead to the prevention of uh, a data subject being able to access their their rights. That's things like the right to be informed, the right to uh, subject access, the right to portability, right to erasure, right to object to automatic decision making, and and so on. So as you can see between those two slides, whilst the regulation is it seems to make it out to be quite quite basic uh, on the face of it, when you consider it, particularly from um, the ICO's point of view, um, there's actually much more to be considered than, than those sort of three key areas. Um, and in fact, if you look at um, the Information Commissioner's website, ico.org.uk, they've actually provided some examples. There's a, a, um, a some detail um, guidance around DPIA, um, some examples of processing that's likely to result in high risk and, and, and other areas, and, and it gives a, a list of examples. So, for example, you know, if you're uh, if you're doing systematic evaluation based on automatic processing or profiling, um, resulting in legal or other significant effects then that might include things like credit checks, mortgage loan applications, fraud prevention, application of artificial intelligence, and so on. So they provide a, 
um, a subset of um, different types of scenarios where um, your processing might consider uh, be considered to be high risk um, or in, in other areas where you need to uh, consider carrying out a data protection impact assessment. So um, apologies for those not in the UK, um, but uh, in reality, um, you're going to be expected to carry out a data protection impact assessment in most circumstances where you're doing something um, new and, and that's to be able to demonstrate your compliance and your accountability. And, you know, you, you possibly be, be able to look at the circumstances and say, hi, well, you know, hey, this, this, this um, risk is not really high. It's not something that we really want to carry out a data protection impact assessment on and you might want to make that decision. You ought to document that decision, but in reality, it's in your own interest to carry a data protection impact assessment, whether the law says you should or shouldn't do it, whether the ICO says you shouldn't do it, because having that documented process in place, having that um, documentation, should you ever be quizzed about why you're doing what you're doing with data, you'll have that um, um, to hand to be able to demonstrate that you've considered um, data protection compliance. Um, which is, as again, I, I say one, hopefully but probably the last time, um, that's what the accountability principle is all about. And that could be, you know, that could be your get out of jail card if you if you needed one um, at any circumstance, um, because you want to be able to say, well, we did consider it and we didn't think there was any risks and clearly we were wrong and we're going to make sure we rectify that. That's going to be different than saying, actually, no, we didn't realise we needed to do anything or we haven't done anything. And no, I can't demonstrate to you that we've carried out a, a, an impact assessment. So when this comes to actually what this means in, in reality and in practice, how do we carry out a DPIA? Well, the, the Information Commissioner from a UK perspective talks about eight steps. Um, some of them, I think, are, are slightly duplicated in one way or another and slightly convoluted, um, but you can, you can look at those. I've sort of broken it down into six key areas. Um, the key thing is that somebody does something within your organisation um, about understanding whether they need to carry out a DPIA. So somebody's got to take ownership or responsibility for carrying out the data protection impact assessment. Who that is within your organization will depend on how your organization is structured, who's taking responsibility around data protection, whether it's the project lead, whether it's a DPO, a data protection officer, for example, if you've got one, be they mandated or otherwise. You need to decide who within your um, project or within your business um, needs to be involved and needs to answer those questions that you might have around what exactly is this project doing and what you're going to be doing with personal data and, and how do you um, uh, answer some of the questions that you'll need to go through from a, a DPIA perspective. So that might be looking at involving a data protection officer, your project lead, your IT um, guys, um, any third party processors or any um, anybody actually using the data within the organization and so on. Um, and obviously, um, you know, if you've got a mandated data protection officer, so by, by law, the GDPR requires certain organizations to have data protection officers. If you've got one, there's a good chance that they should be leading on this anyway, but um, there's a good chance you, you probably ought to involve them because um, they ought to be able to be there to provide guidance and direction should you need it, uh, if indeed they're not already um, the, the people that have been identified as taking responsibility for it. It's not a defined role of, of a D D to DPO, but it is defined that a DPO should be assisting when DPIAs are carrying out. Sorry, there's a, too many uh, acronyms in that sentence. Um, so if you do have a data protection officer, um, really they should be driving, should be at least giving you guidance and advice, but they should might better give you some pointers as to how do you uh, develop um, an idea of who takes responsibility within your organization. You need to document your processing. You need to have a good understandability of understandability. You need to understand very carefully what it is that you are processing and how that data is going to be used, what the system or, or whatever it is that you're going to be doing actually means um, in terms of the day-to-day -day processing. It's good for you to have that anyway, because as I said, because of the accountability principle, um, but you want to be recording the kind of processing you're carrying out, the kind of data, the kinds of data subjects who are impacted. And by kind of data, I mean, you know, whether that's personal data, special categories of data, and specifically what it is, name, you know, name email address, date of birth, um, biometric identifier or, or whatever, um, and also where the data is coming from. Is it stuff that you're collecting directly from the data subject? Are you provided, being provided it through a system or a third party or, or whatever? Now, <clears throat> the... Um, one of the approaches, and this is the one that I tend to use, is that you can make use of screening questions. So these are, are an initial set of questions that ask very searching 
um, questions about the processing. So it, it is very, um, very specific about the kind of circumstances by which you might be processing data. So you, you can be asking yourself things like, is this data new data that we've never processed before? Is the data subject going to be aware of that processing? Um, is it processing specific types of data? You know, is it biometric genetic data, for example, um, and, and so on. So you can have these set of these set of questions and, and uh, um, there's a, probably about 12 that I use to, to, to determine whether um, you need to carry out a DPI in full. So there's kind of three parts to a data protection impact assessment. The, the documentation or the recording of what the actual processing is that you're going to be doing, which is sort of step one. Step two is carry out some initial analysis using some screening questions. And if you answer yes to any of these questions, then you need to do the third step, which is the, the full on um, proper analysis of the circumstances, identifying and, and analyzing the risks and working out what the, 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 um, what the risks are and how you mitigate those risks. So you can use um, a set of screening questions. You, you, you have no choice if it's um, high risk processing, you're going to have to go on to the, the, the um, third part anyway. Um, but you can use those uh, screening questions as an initial way of sort of filtering out whether you need to really carry out a full on um, uh, data protection impact assessment. Now, in terms of what those screening questions might look like in reality, well, you can use, uh, if you look at the Information Commissioner's uh, website, for example, it talks about a, a checklist, a screening checklist, but it, it is very much focused on the high risk aspects of, of, of um, what the DPI is talking about, because rather confusingly, that's what they talk about, even though they say you ought to be doing other things. But I, I would say you probably want to have a look out for, if you look for the old um, privacy impact assessment screening questions, um, which are still available. Um, if you, uh, I think if you're um, Google ICO, uh, privacy impact assessment screening questions, you'll you'll get a link to, to their document. So you can make use of those. As part of that um, process and carrying out the DPIA, you'll need to determine who it is you're going to have to consult with. That's probably going to be your data protection officer because they need to give you some, um, some guidance. Um, you might need to consult with the data subjects themselves. You might need to say to them you're going to be using their data in a different way and and you know will they consent to that if that's what the lawful basis of the processing is going to be you will need to possibly involve any um, uh, discussions with the processor particularly if you're using third-party processes um, to process your data um, and consider anybody who internally might act as an expert about the system about the relationship between um, the system you're going to be using if it's a third-party cloud-based service for example and and the managing that relationship getting the information that you need um, and, and so on. And then when it comes to carrying out the data protection impact assessment, again, you can use a templated set of questions and the Information Commissioner very helpfully has provided um, through their uh, DPIA section on their website uh, as part of the GDPR um, guidance, um, a template that you can use. And, and it has a set of questions that you need to ask yourself. So it sort of builds on what those screening questions were asking, but in a, in a lot more detail. And the idea is that you will use those to reflect upon and uh, in, uh, inevitably identify what the risks are. Um, and then there's a section where you actually identify those risks um, and uh, work out whether you can mitigate them. Because the key thing with a data protection impact assessment, as I said, is a risk management exercise. What are the risks to, from our processing? How do we mitigate against those risks? So what can we put in place to prevent those risks from, from happening? But once you've, once you've done that and you have that document, document that's got the processing uh, description, it's maybe you've used the screening questions and you've you've decided that you do need to do something much more wider, or even if um, you decide you don't, you've still got that recorded. But if you move on to the third step and carry out that DPIA and identify those risks, um, that's not the that's not necessarily the end. Um, and the reason it's not necessarily the end is if you get to the conclusion that there are risks but you can't do anything about them, the GDPR requires you, and the ICO would expect you to get in touch with them and tell them all about it so that they can then pass uh, judgment on whether they think that it's okay for you to continue uh, or start processing in that way. I, I Yes, there are risks, but um, you don't need to worry about them. Now, they're, they're kind of saying that they'll take up to two weeks to respond to, uh, to that, but um, there's a good possibility that it might be longer if there's lots of people asking them those kind of questions. 
Um, and um, as part of that process, they might take an initial view that actually, if you're already processing the data, you must stop immediately and not do it until they've um, determined uh, precisely what their position is on it. But um, yes, if you if you do get to the end of your DPIA and realise that you have risks that you can't um, prevent, then you will need to consult the information commissioner or the or the um, uh, regulator in in your particular country. Um, you'll need to keep it as documented, um, as a documented record, I should say. Um, and it's probably worth reviewing it on a regular basis just to make sure, you know, so if you're if you're doing it as part of a new project and you are um, also considering um, whether you, uh, you know, sorry, you're doing that as part of the process early on in the project lifecycle, when the project actually launches, you might want to sort of reflect about the risks and make sure that all the checks and balances are in place. You might not need to do that depending on what uh, your involvement was uh, as part of the wider project plan. Um, and just at this point, it's also worth reflecting that potentially, um, and there's not an, 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 an immediate amount of clarity on this, but potentially if you've been processing um, data that would be considered high risk um, specifically um, based on what the uh, ICO say is high risk, what the GDPR says and what the Article 29 Working Party says about how to con consider a high risk. So that's going to be things like profiling, tracking, um, uh, processing large amounts of special category data, for example. Then if you've not got a privacy impact assessment in your pocket um, already or you've not carried out a D DPIA, you probably want to strongly consider doing one. So carry out one retrospectively. Um, and in a general sense, if you have in the past carry out a privacy impact assessment, it is certainly worth. So um, in the UK, you might have done that under the uh, Data Protection Act 1998. Um, it's certainly worth revisiting that and just make sure that um, it, it is uh, addressing all of the points that uh, the ICO are saying um, uh, under the DPIA rules and what the GDPR says about um, carrying them out under high risk scenarios. So, um, yeah, so. So don't necessarily think, oh, I'm not planning on doing anything in the future, so therefore I don't need to worry about this. You might want to sort of uh, gaze back into the um, recent past and, and consider the circumstances where you might need to have carried one out. And if there are circumstances, definitely if there's high risk circumstances, consider carrying out a DPIA. If you haven't, if you've got one already um, from uh, past work that you've done um, pr prior to GDPR, then you might want to just review that and make sure that you're um, you're up to date and, and uh, in line or the privacy impact assessment is in line with what um, the regulations require. Now in, in practice, I mean whilst I, you know that previous screen sort of gives you those six key things that you need to consider, there's a few other things you need to think about and um, as to say the, the screening questions and a template for um, carrying out the DPIA are, are available from the regulators and um, there's uh, various bits of guidance are available as well, uh, particularly the Article 29 Working Party, which sort of talks about what, what a DPIA should be doing and what you should expect to be doing from that as well. But within your own organisations, there's a few things for you to, to, to certainly consider. And we've kind of touched on some of these, but probably the key thing, other than what we've said already, is make sure everybody across your business understands this requirement about data protection impact assessments. If you're rolling out training, which you should have been doing, uh, rolling out training or you're providing guidance and, and documentation uh, about compliance, which again, you really ought to be doing because uh, the both of the training and documentary uh, policies and procedural documents are great tools to uh, fend off any accusations that you're not compliant, um, as long as people are abiding by what they say, of course. Um, if nobody across your business realizes, so your IT guy decides that he's found, uh, you know, or maybe approached by uh, somebody across the business saying, we want to use, start using this system because it's fantastic. It can do all these things for us and it's going to help. That IT guy or even the, the person who's um, instigating the project needs to understand that data protection needs to be considered as part of that if there's processing of personal data and somebody needs to engage with the data protection officer if you have one. But the key thing is that people across your business um, understand that there is this requirement for data protection impact assessments and from a, a UK perspective that's much wider than just what the GDPR says because if people across your business are busy doing their day jobs and getting on and doing things and finding new ways of processing data that they haven't thought about 
they need to consider whether DPIA is, is necessary. And of course, if they don't even know that there's this concept exists because nobody's ever spoken to them about it or not talked about it in any detail, they're not going to understand that they need to go and ask or find out about um, what carrying out DPIA actually means. And certainly when I when I deliver training um, to teams and businesses, as part of that training, I talk about these sort of back end processes. So things like the controller process of third party processing due diligence, but also DPIAs, um, the concept of data protection by design and default and, and so on. So these are all key things that sort of go on behind the scenes that somebody within the organization needs to take responsibility for. But across the business, everybody needs to understand that there is this concept that exists in compliance and it's a key part of uh, the organization's data protection compliance. So I can't stress enough, make sure people across your business understand what DPIAs actually mean and more importantly, how they reflect on what that means to them in their particular role. Make sure you have somebody within your organization who takes some responsibility. The, the key person to, to sort of point that finger at is probably the data protection officer. If you've got one or somebody taking responsibility for data, data protection in your business, and indeed having somebody within your business taking responsibility for data protection is a good thing anyway, because uh, again, that helps coordinate compliance across the business. Have a procedural document, a policy document, whatever works best within your, uh, your organization that sets out how you carry out a DPIA and the circumstances by which a DPIA will need to be applied and, and the procedure by which the organization will need to, um, to, to follow to, uh, to deliver on the DPIA. Have your screening questions and, and, and your full DPIA assessment tools um, to hand, put them as part of the, uh, the policy or the procedure documents that you might have in place. Make sure you carry out a DPIA uh, as early as you possibly can uh, in project life cycles, but as I said, consider you know, retrospectively carrying that out if, if necessary or indeed updating anything that you may have done in the past um, um, that uh, you might want to review and definitely keep a record of it. You know, keep them filed away somewhere so that if you ever need them, you can either rely on them for, for clarifying some, some particular issues internally, but also because of the accountability principle, they're a great tool to be able to demonstrate your compliance. So a bit more than those things that I uh, listed as what actually you do when you're carrying out a DPIA, um, there's some other stuff that you need to consider sort of internally as well um, around making sure that you, you, you kind of meet that DPIA compliance and expectation. So that was really what I, all I wanted to, to cover. Um, if you've got questions, use that control panel. I just briefly wanted to sort of say about the digital compliance sub. I, I'm, I'm running an, a I've been running a series of webinars and I've got some more planned and um, I haven't published them yet um, through the digital compliance sub. Um, the digital compliance sub is an online subscription based service. You become a member and you get access to guidance toolkits. Um, and I've got plans for other kinds of things like, um, um, you know, being able to download the screening questions and uh, procedural documents around DPIA and so on. Um, but it's also got a human element to it because there's a help desk so um, you can book a, a call or um, have access to unlimited email support. So if you are a member and you've got a question or you're not sure, you know, if, if from a DPIA point of view, you know, is this high risk processing? Do I need to carry out a DPIA or whatever? If you can't find the guidance that you're looking for within the hub, um, you can always book a call or, or get email support um, to uh, help answer those questions. So um, you can try it for 14 days. Um, there's a lot of uh, stuff that I've got plans to deliver through the system that's going to be much more wider than um, what's there at the moment, but also in, in certainly in terms of toolkits. But um, there's a big focus on GDPR for very obvious reasons. But um, with the impending e-privacy regulation um, in U uh, the new European e-privacy regulation happening at some point, probably next year, um, there's going to be quite a lot around privacy, use of cookies, um, consent in the marketing scenario and, and so on, um, as well as some other areas as well. So um, I hope that was helpful um, and uh, gives you some pointers of things to think about within your organisation. I think from a, a, a sort of a key compliance point of view, the key things are that 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 slide of the, 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 the circles, um, you know, make sure people inside your organisation understand um, that DPIs have to be carried out. Make sure somebody takes responsibility for doing them. So don't all think that somebody else is de dealing with them. Make sure somebody has ownership. Um, make sure you've got documentation in place, including um, your screening questions if you decide to use them or, or the DPIA template at least. Um, so you have that to hand to get that going as soon as possible. 
um, and make sure you keep a record of it um, uh, as part of uh, your wider um, demonstration of compliance. So um, there's now time to um, ask your questions. Uh, we've got about 20 minutes, uh, but uh, I'll end it sooner if there, there aren't any questions. Um, so the uh, there is a questions panel um, in your control panel for GoToWebinar, which you can ask. And there's a few um, comments. So um, a couple of thank yous, which is nice. Thank you very much. Um, right, so let me have a look. So um, Michelle is asking, um, yeah, so Michelle's asking a question very similar to what I sort of touched on, which was, if an impact assessment has never been done for any processing prior to GDPR, do you need to do one? Well, strictly speaking, from a legislation point of view, I think that there's probably um, you could probably argue that if you're not doing high risk processing, you can possibly get away with not having to do one. Um, and as long as you're clear that the processing you're doing fits in with what your uh, data subjects expectations are, then you're, you're probably not full foul of any kind of questions around unlawful processing. But if you're doing very clever things with data, or you're starting to use artificial intelligence or you're um, doing profiling, tracking, processing large quantities of special category data, and you've never carried out an impact assessment, then I would say, yes, for sure, you should carry out one as soon as you possibly can, um, retrospectively, even though it's not a new system or a new process. Um, and even if you decide that you don't need to carry one out, you might want to consider carrying one out because it goes back to that point of saying, well, you know, it's part of this arsenal of, of um, demonstration of compliance. If you've got a, well, we didn't need to carry out a data protection impact assessment, but we did. And we considered all the risks and we found that, as we thought, there were none, but at least we've documented that. And in those kind of situations, that may just be dealing with the screening questions and just being able to show from the screening questions that there probably isn't um, um, anything that you particularly need to worry about. But having that, um, as I say, sort of uh, available should you ever be questioned um, is, is probably a good idea. So, so, so yes, you do need to consider if you should have done one, you need to do one. Um, if that was something you were doing prior to GDPR, um, post GDPR, if you've still not done one, then yes, you definitely ought to, to get on, a, on, on and do one. Uh, so Spiros is asking, could we get a slides of presentation sent out to emails? Yes. Uh, so a recording or a link to a recording and um, and the slides will be sent out uh, at some point um, after uh, um, this presentation, um, probably sometime this week, hopefully, but um, maybe early next week. Uh, in fact, there's a couple of questions uh, about that. Um, so Sean's asking, are there any templates available for DPIAs? Um, I mean, there are various organisations that can supply one um, for you. I, I'm putting together one for the for the hub, but um, you know, if you want, uh, if you if you want to, um, depending on where you're based in the world, but um, you know, there shouldn't be anything reason why you can't look at the Information Commissioner's website. If you go to ico.org.uk, go to the uh, front page of that site. There's a link to General Data Protection. There's a DPIA or Data Protection Impact Assessment link down the left hand side in amongst its menu. Um, and then there's a link to detailed um, a, a guidance on DPIA. And as part of that, there is a DPIA template which you can use and you can adapt that to, to, to your own needs. Um, other than that, I'm sure that there's quite a few um, about out and about that you can possibly uh, find as well. OK, so that's come to the end of the questions that have been posted. Has, has anybody got anything else they'd like to ask? Uh, if not, we'll we'll end it there. Uh, thank you very much for the, the thanks that are coming through. It's um, really appreciated. OK, well, nothing else is coming through. Um, if you get a burning question that you wish you'd asked um, when you get the uh, email with um, the link to the slides and the uh, recording, uh, you know, feel free to, to ping me an email. If it's something I can answer uh, quite quickly, then I'll, I'll uh, give you an answer. Otherwise, um, 
sorry, just checking there's a few coming in, uh, mainly thank yous. So uh, yeah, again, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so let's leave it at that. Thank you very much for joining. I hope you found it useful um, and uh, I'll uh, distribute a copy of the slides and, and the recording um, at some point in the, in the very near future. So uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your, your day and indeed your week. Thanks.